The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorf. Every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. When a project gets past the prototyping stage, you'll want to get PCBs made so you can build multiple copies of it. In the past, I've used programs such as Express PCB to both design the board and order it. This is fast and easy for smaller projects, but not cost effective for more complex projects with larger runs. A better recourse in that situation is to use Eagle software to design a PCB. It outputs industry standard Gerber files that you can send to the PCB supply house of your choice. It also generates parts lists so you can get the boards pre-stuffed. In today's episode, I'll show you how to get started with Eagle so you can export those industry standard files to make the projects you need. But first, the news. Since we're working on Eagle today, I'll show you some boards that I uh, had made with Eagle. So I designed these in Eagle and I created Gerber files and with those files I could send them to any board house I wanted to get my boards. So these are from Seed Studio, which is a service in China. It only take about three days to actually ship here. And these are little RGB drivers. Here is the board stuffed. It has two RGB LEDs and then a PWM driver that you send data to and then you don't have to manually do the PWM. The purpose of this is it goes in the Ghost Squad game right here and illuminates the ghost. Originally we had two modules, individually addressable, however that's kind of a waste because the ghost is only one color. So with one module, you have to send less data. So basically I created circuit boards so I could send less data. But hey, anything that helps. So these stuffed are probably like, I don't know, $2, so not bad. I'm also going to make some boards for these optos and the uh, combo board underneath. An important thing to talk about before we get started with Eagle are the libraries. Libraries are files inside of Eagle that define what parts you can use in your schematic and your boards. Each part has two components to it. It has a schematic view, which is basically how it electrically connects to things. And then there's a physical board layout, which is what it actually looks like on a PCB. So we need to get those libraries set up before we can really get started with Eagle. Eagle has many libraries built in, but you'll probably want to add more based off your needs. For example, I have an Adafruit library here that I'd like to use. I can copy paste it into the LBR folder in Program Files x86 Eagle. Now this library will show up next time I start Eagle. You can copy paste the entire folder or just the LBR file. You can find many libraries for parts on the node, which is part of the element14.com website. Here I'm selecting one I want, opening it as a zip file, and copying that folder into the LBR folder again in the Eagle installation. Copying the entire folder, readmes and all, keeps it organized. You can also specify a path for libraries under options forward slash directives. Now that we have some new libraries installed, let's design a small AT tiny development board. We select new project, give it a name, then we'll select new schematic to start our design. We are now in the schematic view. This is where we'll design our circuit. Click this icon to add a part. The library window opens. Looking around, they have Atmel parts, but not the ones we want. So we click on Library Use to select which libraries we want to use. In this case, the new Atmel library we downloaded from the node. Now when we click Add Part, we go to the new Atmel library from Element 14, scroll down and find the part that we want to use. Click OK, then click again to drop the part on the schematic. You can click and drop more copies of the part, but we only need one. Hit escape twice to exit out of dropping the parts. All right, we have our part place. Now I'm gonna go over here to get a net connection. And then we're gonna draw net connections coming off the part. So you one click to start it, two clicks to stop it. And we'll want to put them on all of the connections. Over here we have power and ground, and over here we have our IO. It's an AT Tiny, so PB5 uh, is also used as a reset button. We don't want to use that as I.O. because then we'll need a high voltage programmer, which we don't have. We then go back to add, but this time we're adding a power signal, not a part. Do a search for supply and you'll find many choices. For this project, we want five volts and ground. We select five volts and drop it just like we would a part and connect it to the VCC line of the integrated circuit. Eagle asks if we want to connect net segment N dollar sign one to positive five volts, we say yes. Now the parts are officially connected. We do the same thing for ground. Let's add a capacitor to the power input. We find a 0805 package surface mount capacitor and place it on the schematic. From here we can go two ways. 
The first is to use the copy tool. We can click on a part, then click it again to place copies of it. This is handy for common things like power and ground. We copy those to the capacitor, then connect them to the capacitor with lines. We must use lines to connect it, we can't just butt the symbols up against the part. This tool here is the nut junction. Use it to ensure your lines are connected. Lines can even visually cross each other, but won't be connected unless you use a nut junction. We can also place the capacitor directly on the existing lines near the microcontroller. Again, use lines and nut junctions to make sure everything's connected. A quick way to check is to use the move tool and jostle the part around to see if the lines follow it. Now that we've got the basics down, we can start hooking up the input-output lines to our microcontroller. First, we draw lines on the IOs. We'll be labeling these lines, not the connections on the microcontroller itself. Then we go over here and get the label tool. Every line has a default name, which you can change. Placing a label on the line allows you to see what name it has. Select a label style you like, then click on the line. A label appears with its default name. We'll do this for all six of the I.O. Eagle components have both names and values, and you can set them with these tools. A name describes the part or line, like ADC0, and is used when linking parts together. A value indicates just that, the value, such as a 20 ohm resistor. For instance, we click value, then click on our capacitor, then type in that it's a one microfarad capacitor. This value will now appear on the PCB silkscreen. We want to give our I.O. lines names. Click the name tool, then click on each line to name it. Each name should be unique. Here's where the magic happens. If we name other lines in our schematic the same as these, Eagles will automatically link them for our PCB. Of course, if you don't want things to link, make sure they have unique names. Finally, we get to add another part, a tack switch to use as a reset button. We'll need the switch itself, plus a pull-up resistor since reset is active low. We'll attach the resistor to the switch, add lines for reset, positive 5 volts and ground, copy those existing symbols, and attach them to our switch lines. Let's connect our first symbol. We put a label on this line, then we name that label Reset. Eagle asks if we want to connect this line to the existing reset line, which is on the microcontroller. Click Yes, now they are considered the same thing. They are connected. We can visually check connections by clicking the Show tool, which looks like an eyeball, then clicking on lines to show, in bold, what they are connected to. Next, we'll want to add a programming header for the AVR ISP Mark II, so we can program the ATtiny. From the ATtiny's datasheet, we find the proper names for each pin. For programming, we need reset, master in, slave out, master out, slave in, and serial clock. On our schematic, we rename the relevant lines. Let's select a six-pin header for attaching the AVR programmer. Like every part, we start by attaching lines to it, then we label and name each of these lines. We type in the same names as the lines on our microcontroller to make sure they're connected. For this line, let's try an experiment. We'll name it Butt Monkey. When we hit OK, it won't ask us if we want to connect it because nothing else in the schematic is called that, thankfully. If we do rename it to the correct thing, it will ask about the connection since that connection exists elsewhere on the schematic. Remember, you can use the eyeball-shaped show tool to show that your lines are connected to each other. Again, we'll need positive 5 volts and ground, so we copy those existing symbols and connect them to our programming header. Eagle asks about making connections, it means the connection is getting made. It lets you know it's working. Let's add a 10-pin header for prototyping. Again, we attach lines, then label and name each of these lines to connect them to the signals we want. We'll also put positive voltage, ground, and reset on this header. Here's our complete schematic. I've added an additional Molex connector for power. At this point, we can take the schematic and turn it into a board. Go up here and click the Board Schematic Switcher button, then click Yes, I'd like to create a board file. The largest online community for engineers, Element 14, and one of engineering's most brilliant minds, Jeremy Bloom, are partnering to boost your Arduino skills. Jeremy's new book, Exploring Arduino, contains Arduino exercises and lists the parts needed to master them. Here to review his book is Jeremy Bloom. This book is awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. Visit element14.com forward slash exploring Arduino to get his book, plus exclusive access and pricing for the parts. Expert inspiration from fellow electronic enthusiasts and one of the internet's most active Arduino communities, go to element14.com forward slash exploring Arduino today. The two main views in Eagle are the schematic view and the board view. They're both linked together. I like to put them on my dual monitors, one in each monitor, so it's a lot easier to work with. This is the board view. It's linked to our schematic window, which is still open. Anything you change in one will reflect to the other, though typically the schematic drives the board, not the other way around. 
I immediately see a problem, our Molex connector is too big. So we go back to our schematic view, drop in a smaller connector, and reattach it to the power and ground lines. Hit the switcher button to go back to the board view, and you'll see we have a new connector in place. Okay, let's lay out our board. We'll start by adding two holes for screw mounting, then position the parts to the right of that using the move tool. This gives us the basic dimension we'll need. With all the parts roughly in place, we can use the move tool again to make the PCB outline fit our parts. Here's a very important thing. Go up to view and click layer settings. This shows what components of the board or layers are visible, and you can toggle any layer on or off. For instance, layer 20, dimension, shows the outer perimeter of the PCB that will be cut. Layer 1 is the top surface copper, and layer 16 is the bottom copper. You can click all or none to show or hide all layers. There are some you usually don't want to see, such as cream or glue, so you can manually turn those off after doing a show all. Let's further adjust the position of the mounting holes and size the PCB to match. Another useful tool is Grid. This changes the grid snapping or alignment of your components and traces. Select a resolution that's best for your project. It's a good idea to have one that's the same as the distance between your pins and your components, so if your pins are 0.1 inch apart, have 0.1 inch or half of that for your grid spacing. Going to reposition the components a bit more here. The yellow lines you see are called air wires, or sometimes called the rat's nest. They represent how the components are connected based off the names you used in the schematic. At this point, we could route the traces automatically using the auto router tool. Click the tool, select a few basic guidelines, and bam, your board is routed. Auto routing is great, and it does work. However, most designers prefer to route boards manually, so let's take a look at how that's done. First, we go over here and click the route tool. We'll select a width for the traces and then start interconnecting things. You might recall in our schematic a lot of things were connected to ground. Let's grab this polygon tool and click four corners to make a square. Now, like anything else, we can go to the name tool and give this square polygon a name. Let's name it ground. This will connect it to anything else that's ground. This is the rat's nest tool. When we click it, Eagle will recalculate everything. Our yellow air wires will get less messy, and our polygon labeled ground gets connected to anything that's ground. By making a polygon larger than the PCB, we can create an entire filled ground plane, saving us a lot of manual connections. Let's manually route some connections. Click the trace tool on a pin, then follow the yellow air line to complete the circuit. Tap the right mouse button to change the shape of the bends. Here we're connecting reset to where it goes in the programming header, as well as the reset switch. Hit rat's nest to map your new traces against the ground plane. Think of rat's nest like a refresh button. To make a connection through the PCB, use the via tool. Place a via where you'd like it to go, then name it to match the connection that will go through it. Otherwise, the via won't work. Here we're naming the via positive five volts so we can pass the power line from the bottom of the PC up to the surface mount IC. To route a trace in the bottom of the board, click the route tool, then click here to select a layer. Now we can run a positive 5 volt trace from the header to the via so it can pass to the IC. I'll continue to route traces for all the signals and use vias when necessary. Remember to click rat's nest to see how everything's going. To redo a trace, use the rip up tool to remove segments of it that you don't want. Try and keep as much space in between traces as possible to ensure the resulting PCB won't have gaps or short circuits when manufactured. Eagle contains two types of error checking. Electrical rules check, which is for the schematic, and design rules check, which is for the PCB. Let's go back to the schematic and click electrical rule check. It will give us a list of any problems found. We'll fix these missing junctions it found and add more junctions just to be sure. We can choose to ignore some errors like missing values or the fact that VCC is connected to five volts. We'll hit ERC again and no errors found, we're good to go. On the board side, there's a tool called design rules check. This refers to the capabilities of the PCB manufacturing house and checks to see if your board fits their parameters. Click the DRC buttons in the board view and hit load. This takes you to Eagle's default folder for design rule files, which have a DRU extension. In your web browser, not Eagle, go to your PCB supplier website and download their Eagle design rules. Copy this file directly into the design rules folder. Now you always know where it is. Load your new file, then click check to make sure your PCB is okay. Afterwards, click Rat's Nest again as these new rules may change some things, such as how close copper fill can be to the edge of the board. Now we can make some Gerber files, which a PCB house requires for manufacture. Click the CAM processor button to open the window, then File Open Job. This brings up the folder where CAM processors are stored. 
Again, browse to your PCB supplier's website and download their Gerber generator file. This tells your copy of Eagle how to generate the correct files to use on the supplier's equipment. Copy this CAM file into Eagle's CAM folder, then load it. Click Process Job and your Gerber files will be created. By default, they're in the same folder as your schematic and board files. Let's check our files. CircuitPeople.com has a free online Gerber file viewer. Check each layer and look for anything obvious, like this missing trace on our programming header. Back in the board view, we see an air wire there, but no actual trace. We'll fix that, then reprocess our CAM job. With the files checked, it's time to pack everything up. Eagle generated 12 total Gerber files, but your board house might not require all of these. Place the relevant ones inside of a zip file. This is what you'll submit when you order your boards. So there you have it. We started with Eagle, we did a schematic, we turned that schematic into a PCB, and then we used a CAM processor to turn that PCB into files we could send to a board house to get a real PCB we can hold in our hands. You can download a free version of Eagle at cadsoftusa.com and try it yourself. Today's viewer question comes from Philip who asks, could you do an episode discussing electronic shielding on your show? I've recently had issues with the project and could use some help. That sounds like a good idea, Philip, because shielding is very important, especially with modern high-speed data connections. We'll be sure to pencil it in for a future topic. Thanks for the suggestion. Thanks for watching. In our next episode, we'll be taking to the road and visiting the 2013 World Maker Fair in New York. Our intention is to show you what it's like to actually visit the fair and hopefully inspire you to visit a local fair the next time one's in your area. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.